uh, practical idea kind of, of how we do it and how it's, what's expected because <clears throat> there are a number of catechumens and inquirers who are getting ready for lifetime confessions, you know, between Pascha and Pentecost. Um, if I'm counting correctly, I believe we're going to have 19 baptisms and chrismations. And um, so there's a lot of confessions that are going to be that are going to be going on. And people, this is recorded tonight, so the people who are not able to be here can go and watch uh, and, and listen and kind of see what's expected. First, I want to talk about the history of um, <clears throat> confession. You know, confession is present in the Old Testament. If you haven't spent much time in the Old Testament, when you had sins, and, and Leviticus goes into great detail about what those sins may or may not be, uh, then it prescribes what you are to do, and it repeats the phrase, you are to go to the priest, uh, and you are to confess and have a, uh, a sacrifice. The priest is to offer a sacrifice on your behalf, um, and your sins will be forgiven, and there, there is restitution and things. And you can read about it in Leviticus chapter, well, a lot of chapters, but specifically you can look at chapter 5, chapter 6, and see what confession looks like in the Bible. In the Old Testament. And then, of course, in the New Testament, um, the, the, <clears throat> the most famous one that we think about when we think of, of New Testament confession is from the Epistle of James, where he tells us to confess our sins one to another. And that can be a little bit um, confusing for somebody who uh, is Orthodox, and they say, wait a minute, confess our sins one to another? What's he talking about there? And <clears throat> what he's referring to is, in the early church, uh, confession was public. Um, and so, when you were going to make a confession, <clears throat> you confessed it before the community. Uh, I'll, I'll read a quote by St. Basil the Great, where he says, It is necessary to confess our sins to those whom the dispensation of God's mysteries is entrusted. In other words, the priests and the bishops. Those doing penance of old are found to have done it before the saints. In other words, in the midst of a congregation. It is written in the gospel that they confessed their sins to John the Baptist, for example. But in Acts, they confessed to the apostles. In Acts chapter 19. So St. Basil points out that, uh, that, that, there was this, that there was a movement in the early uh, history of the church from confessing within a group to confessing to specifically to individuals. And that kind of goes on. You can see the Didache in the year 70 AD uh, says, confess your sins in church. And they were literally talking about it in church, that you would stand before the congregation and confess your sins. It says, do not go up to your prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. On the Lord's day, gather together, break bread, and give thanks after confessing your transgressions so that your sacrifice may be pure. Uh, Tertullian says regarding confession some flee from this work as being an exposure of themselves or they put it off from day to day does that sound familiar some they, they stay away from communion because it's exposing yourself right uh, or we just put it off well tomorrow I'll go to confession or maybe next week and I, well Lent I mean there's four or five weeks left in Lent I'll just wait and he, so this is what he's referring to he says, I presume they are more mindful of modesty than of salvation. Like those who contract a disease in the more shameful parts of the body, and shun making themselves known to the physicians, and thus they perish along with their own bashfulness. And Tertullian didn't pull any punches. He was like, hey, if you get a disease down there, go to the doctor or you're going to die. You know? And he's like, that's what confession is. Don't be too ashamed to go to the priest and say, hey, this is what's going on. Because then you're going to die with your sins. That's what he's saying here. <clears throat> Finally, uh, St. Cyprian of Carthage, and I, I switched it up, by the way, so anybody who's here heard my confession talk in, in years past. These are all new quotes tonight. <clears throat> the great thing about Orthodox, you're like, how many volumes on confession can I go through? St. Cyprian of Carthage says, of how much greater faith and salutary fear are they who confess their sins to the priests of God in a straightforward manner and in sorrow, making an open declaration of conscience. I beseech you, brethren, let everyone who has sinned confess his sin 
while he is still in this world, while his confession is still admissible, while the satisfaction and remission made through the priests are still pleasing before the Lord. That's the year 251. Right? So, confession's been there from the beginning. Everybody who writes on confession is very serious. you got to go to confession. It's something that we do. This is how we, within the church, this is how we <laughs> formally receive God's, the, the seal of God's forgiveness of our sins. It's a, um, it's a very, very important thing for all of the early church writers. So, <clears throat> uh, it was, you, you could see how there was a shift, even within these few quotes, there was a shift from public confession into confessing to the priests. That took place in the early life of the church um, for various reasons. Probably uh, one would be, uh, for example, that if you were infiltrated, when it was illegal to be a Christian, if your community was infiltrated uh, and, and people could hear your confession, the things that you did, then they could take those to the authorities and it could have a, a disastrous effect for you and possibly for the community. Uh, so th there were elements like that where it just it became better for the uh, people to go and con confess to the priest who then hears your confession on behalf of the parish. And when he uh, reads the prayer of absolution, the priest <coughs> is assuring you both of God's forgiveness and also welcoming you back into the communion of the church. So it's something he's doing on behalf of the whole group. So then confession becomes... <clears throat> a, a, a private event, right? Something that is sealed. I, I don't, I don't uh, reveal anybody else's confession. Um, I don't talk to other people about what you confess. That doesn't happen. That's not what we do as priests. What what you say, we call it. It's beneath the stole. That means nobody else gets to know. And literally, we put the stole over your head, uh, and and you confess. What you say under there is private. It's between you and me and God. Um. You confess your sins. Everybody, for example, when they come to the church, they have a lifetime confession, unless you're baptized as a child. Uh, and, and so then you're supposed to learn confession from about the age of seven. You know, your parents bring you, and we talk about it, and, and you begin confessing around the age of seven. So you're getting used to the idea of confession. Um, it was harder, you know, if you become, if you become uh, orthodox as an adult or as a teen or a young adult, you know, and you've never done it before, it can be extremely hard to go in there and <clears throat> overcome that immense fear of saying things out loud uh, to another person that you never thought you would say to anybody, you know. Um, and so it's, it's a daunting thing, and everybody says that, you know, when they come for confession, a lifetime confession, almost every single person is shaking, as we should be. And that was even St. Basil, when he said that, he said, Oh, I've lost my quote. Well, anyway, he said, "You come together. You come together to sins." I lost my thought. Anyway, the, I'm, I'm referring to the part where he says that you would confess in a way that is straightforward, right? That you would confess in a way that is without uh, presumption, uh, without excuse. Tonight we said, incline not our hearts to evil words to make excuses and sins. And so it's possible to make a bad confession, you know, uh, where you come and you confess, but then as you're confessing, you, you, you tell all the reasons that other people made you do it, you know. Uh, and <clears throat> that's, a, that's a big temptation. It's like the devil's way of saying, like, well, if you're going to go to confession, then I'm not going to make it a very good one. And so you're tempted to, to try to make yourself not really look all that bad. But, but then we call ourselves in the same breath the chief of sinners. You know, so it's like the secret's out. That's the beautiful thing about orthodoxy. You know, people come in, sometimes people who have never been to an orthodox church, they come in and they hear us referring to ourselves as the chief of sinners. And they're like, what? You know, or, or the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. It's a refreshingly shocking thing for some people. They're like, well, you know. Because in, 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 in some circles, you try to make yourself look like you're not a sinner. But we go ahead and confess outright that we're the chief. Um, so when we come to confession, though, really, it shouldn't be a secret. We're going to bring all of our deepest, darkest garbage, and we're going to bring it in there. And what we're doing, we're taking out the garbage. You know, uh, one of the things about living in a family, um, 
with children, sometimes people put things in garbage cans that were intended to go out the same day, you know? And especially, like, if you go out of town for a couple days and somebody left something in there, and you come back and you're like, oh, my goodness gracious. What happens? It begins to rot. It begins to stink. It begins to, like, like fester. It's like growing stuff in there, you know? And <clears throat> that's what happens when we leave our sins unconfessed. They start to make us sick, actually. When we hide stuff, we're not meant to hide stuff. We're meant to get it out. It's like a gangrene. Going to confession is like cleaning it out. You know, it's like getting that stuff out of there. And then what happens? Then there's room for it to heal, for us to heal. So confession then, we make a lifetime confession. There's a preparation for confession in the little red or black pair prayer book, whichever version you have. It goes through the Ten Commandments. You might need a magnifying glass, but you can blow it up if you need a larger version because um, those books are like this big and the print is like six font. You know, it's just really hard to read. Um, but then you prepare for your lifetime confession using this, this preparation for confession. And then you come to confession. And when you come, everybody who's, been, who's never been to confession before comes up and they don't know what they're doing. And that's okay because nobody knows what they're doing the first time. So you're going to come up and <clears throat> I'm going to ask you what you have to confess. Some people bring a note, a, a page, that's good, especially for your lifetime confession. You want to do your best not to forget anything. And you confess everything on that page, and I might stop you. Why would I stop you? Well, for example, people don't know how much depth in which to go. Right? They just don't know how much depth. They're like, what should I say? I'm gonna, I don't want to scandalize the priest. I don't want to hurt the priest. You know, right. But then you also want to make sure you say enough that the priest knows what you're talking about. So you didn't, like, slip it under the radar. You're like, I said it, but nobody knew what that meant. Right? So, good example. <clears throat> is that very, very, uh, that very, very great word with great potential for confusion, lust. So somebody comes in and they confess lust and then they move on. I say, hang on a second. Okay? And many of you who've come to confession know what I'm talking about. Hang on a second. Let's just back up just a second here. You confess lust. Okay. Lustful thought. Lustful thoughts or actions? Yes. Okay. Uh, lustful thoughts, lustful actions. Uh, lustful actions with yourself or with others? Yes. Okay. We're making some progress here. Uh, lustful thoughts with yourself, with uh, others of the same gender, others of the opposite sex. And then they answer that question. And I'll say, with people or with animals? And then they'll answer that question. And, and for those of you who think, He's out in the desert somewhere. The people don't. Yeah, people do this. You're welcome to America. Welcome to the human race. People fall all the time. They probably they had too much to drink one night or they whatever. Who knows? But people get go down paths that you're like, really? Yeah. And you get to clean it out in confession. It's great. And I've already heard all of it. So anybody who thinks like, oh, he's never heard that one. I've heard every single thing. Everything. <clears throat> um, so... And then I will ask you, you know, uh, one-third of, of, of women view pornography, two-thirds of men, Christian men, Orthodox Christian men, view pornography. Those are the statistics. Okay, that's horrendous. It's a cancer, right? I'm going to ask everybody about that. If you use the word lust, we're going to talk about that because it's a sin. It's destructive. Uh, so I'm going to go through all of these things, and then that was, that, that was the word lust. So then we're going to move on, and you're going to confess the next thing. And we're gonna, if we need to pick it apart, we will. Why is that? You go to the doctor, and you say to the doctor, he says, how are you, how's your health? You say, I'm actually in really, really good health. That's wonderful. Why do you say that? Well, I mean, I, I almost never have headaches. <clears throat> oh, that's great. You almost never have, that's super. How often do you say you get headaches? I mean, almost never. Great. How often is that? Maybe every other day. Super. <laughs> great. Okay, and when you get these headaches, and they're just relatively quick, how long do they last? They don't last very long at all. Oh, super. How long is not long at all? Maybe 15 minutes? No, 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 no. Maybe three hours. Oh, okay, so you get headaches every other day for three hours. Where do these headaches take place? Are they in the back of your head, in the side of your head, kind of behind your eye sockets? Yeah, they're kind of behind the eye sockets. Okay, super. Great. So about half the time you're having intense pain behind your eye sockets, but it's not really a big problem, right? 
That's what the doctor does. The doctor probes, you know, he's just because you come in and you might not be a very good judge of what's actually happening in your body. That's why you have a doctor. And so when you come to confession, uh, we, we, we do that. We go through and we, we ask questions. I ask you questions and we have a conversation and we talk about it. And so for the first for the lifetime confession, I usually set aside an hour. And m most people don't use the full hour. Some people are done in five minutes. I mean, the most, the most humbling lifetime confession I've ever heard was about three minutes. It humbled me personally like, like no other confession I've ever heard. Because it was a, a college student who was here years and years and years and years ago who had grown up Orthodox but had never gone to confession. And so it was a lifetime confession of a college student who had absolutely no pretense. There was no, like, excuse making. There was nothing. It was just boom, boom, boom. And I felt like I was standing in the presence of a saint because they confessed so clearly and plainly using all the words that I made sure, they made sure I knew everything they were talking about. And there was no, there was no excuse, nothing. It was just a, this is what I did, done. And I was just standing there in awe because that's how we're supposed to confess. But usually a lifetime confession doesn't take three minutes. But in that case, there was nothing else I could say. There was, I mean, they said everything. So that, that's, a, that, that's a great way to go to the doctor. You know, you go to the doctor and say, hey, my foot's cut. I got a headache half the time. Uh, I got dizzy spells and I got a pain in my tooth. And they say, well, the dentist can take over the pain in your tooth. This other stuff, let's talk. And you get out the, you know, antiseptic and you clean up the slice in the foot and stitch and get to work. So confession is like going to the doctor. You go in, you get cleaned out get healed up, and then when you leave, this is the greatest part. <clears throat> the church teaches that when you leave confession, that your baptismal garment is restored completely to its full glory, the same glory and brightness that it had the day that you went into the waters of baptism. That's just, that's amazing. Because the, the scriptures say that when we confess our sins, that God chooses to forget them, which is really cool. And that God, you know, if God made a, what was it? If, can God make a rock too big for himself to lift? You know, there's these, quite people do these brain teasers, and they're like, well, can God forget? Forget? He chooses to forget our sins when we confess them. They're gone. He's, he's the, and oblivious. And then the scriptures also say that our sins, when we confess them, they are, they are removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Which is how far? As far as it can be, they're just opposite. They're gone. It's really good news. So confession for us then is it is a it is an integral integral part of our Christian life of our walk. Um, how often in our archdiocese, uh, our archdiocese teaches that we come a minimum of once a quarter, once a fasting season. There are you know like four fasting seasons: Lent, uh, the Apostles' Fast, the Dormition Fast, and the Christmas Fast. So once every fasting season we come, um, and that's the minimum. And if we're having trouble with stuff in between that, we come. You know, I have people who in the past have said, well, I'm really struggling with this particular thing. And they'll say, can I come? I want to have accountability. Can I come every Saturday for confession? I say, of course you can. And they just, because they want to have that accountability. They know that if I do this, i got to face Father on Saturday. I really would rather not do that. It just gives them an extra layer of, of strength. And that's great. Some people, that really works well for them. So uh, there are some, some churches that teach that you have to go to confession before every communion. Uh, that is, that is a, a tradition in, in certain jurisdictions within orthodoxy. That's fine. Uh, that is not our tradition. Uh, people who want to do that can do that. I've had people who do that. Uh, but that's, that's not what's prescribed for mine. The thing uh, in our archdiocese, what our bishops want is for you to have an open relationship of confession with your priest. Right? So you don't go to confession, and then you do ten really, really, really bad things, and then you don't say anything about it for three months. You know, you're like, oh, cool, I got to uh, apostles fast, you know. That we, we have an open relationship of confession. So we're not intentionally hiding things. So we just, uh, when we come, we come for confession, and then again, if we have real troubles before three months is up, approximately three months is up, we can come back to confession, or just pull me aside and talk. So 
Um, so that's the long and the short of confession. There is a whole lot more that I've uh, given in other, other talks on confession, but I'm just going to open it up now for questions if anybody has any questions. Valentine. A sinful woman in tears at his feet. Yeah. So David's conversion, you know, if you read the Psalms, David was a lot of, you know, my head swims for my tears. Sure. And you mentioned the importance of Cyprian's conversion to the word sorrow. Can you explain what sorrow is yes. and how that works in confession? Thank you. You just gave me that. That was who I was looking for. Uh, in a <clears throat> confess their sins in a straightforward manner, right? Not making excuses, just to state what the what the issue is, and in sorrow. In sorrow, it means we are sorry for our sin, right? Sorrow it means we are sorry, um, and that's why you know in, in orthodoxy we don't even call it. It's not properly called the sacrament of confession. It's actually properly called the sacrament of repentance. There's a difference, you know, because you can confess and and not repent. You can confess and say, this is what I did, and I'm looking forward to doing it as soon as I leave this building. Mm -hmm. Right? That's not, that's not, that's not the same thing. If, if you confess it, and you say, I know I'm a weak human being, God strengthened me, I don't want to do it again, my, my intention is to not do it again, then you confessed it, and you're making an attempt to, to repent. Right? Uh, but, but there is that difference between confession and repentance. And so we need both. So... Um, to be sorry for our sins, we really need, like David, I mean, you, you look at David and his sorrow, his, he, he saw what he, he was an adulterer and a murderer, and he saw, he, he saw that in clear sight, and he just, he went, he went, how can I do this? I'm a prophet, a priest, and a king, you know, before God, how can I do this? He, he was sorry, and so he was sorrowful before God, and we need to come and be sorry. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that we beat ourselves up and get depressed for three weeks because we did something. You know, the, the question to the monk at the monastery is, what do you do at the monastery all day? And the answer was, we fall down and we get up. And we fall down and we get up. And we fall down and we get up. It's a process. When we fall down, I say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, strengthen me. Lord, help me. And we get up. And we keep going. Because the devil, you know, likes, he wants to add insult to injury. He's like, I knocked you down, now I'm going to keep my boot on the back of your neck by making you feel so shameful and guilty you can't accomplish, accomplish anything. And that's not the same thing uh, as, as, as being sorry for our sin. If it, if it paralyzes us so we're no longer useful to help anybody else or do anything else good and holy and beautiful and helpful to anyone, um, then we're just being paralyzed in sin. We're not just being sorry for our sin. We become victims of Yeah, uh, <clears throat> there are times when um, there, there, there are things that are common with everybody, but like uh, if someone cuts you off in traffic and you have that moment of anger yes. and you may say something inappropriate or your anger David, flares up. you've done that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I preach on that regularly. So. <clears throat> and, and I'm just using this as an example. Yes. There's, there's something common with teenagers. They're having trouble with the video game and... You hear it down the hall? Yes. Um, there are times when, uh, for me, the Lord says, stand back and take a look. And are these some of the things that uh, we should be bringing to confession? Yeah, so so <clears throat> I encourage people to do just that. To when, you know, we, we, we call them little sins, like, you know, what we do to people in traffic. It's an example because anybody who drives knows. Sometimes people just do things you're like, you know, and you say something you shouldn't say, right? And you let your anger get the best of you. And um, and so we don't we, we so when we come to confession, we do we bring that we say, yeah, you know, I've been angry and inappropriate in in traffic. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you for a list of the words or the gestures. I'm, that's I know what you're talking about. You know what I mean, Victoria. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, so so it's enough to say I used four letter words in traffic with somebody. I mean like I know what the four letter words are. I've heard them before. That was dark. And so um, didn't you install that one, Andrew? That was it was you. Uh, so anyway, so so you know it's the point is when you are in confession that you know that you've communicated without holding back. You've communicated so that you feel like when you leave, I knew what you were talking about. But we don't need all the details. And if I need more detail, I'll ask for it. You know, um, as I illustrated with the, the question on lust. And that's for real. You read the, I tell everybody, read the Desert Fathers. Like, there's guys with sheep. You know, I mean, like, it's in the book. I give you the, I'm like, read this. Why? Because it's like a, a textbook of life of people who are living with real sins and really repenting and like raising the dead and walking on water. Like, they're fighting for their souls, and there's all sorts of corruption. It follows them out to the caves. The demons are like twice as many in the caves as there were in the city, you know, because they go out there to try to be saved, and the demons are like, oh, yeah, well, we'll just bring our friends with us then, you know. Um, and so if you're not reading, if you don't read the lives of the dead, I, 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 hold like a, I usually have one that I hold it, but I don't have one. But, you know, it has Jesus with his armor on St. Anthony the Great on the front, and um, it's called the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Everybody... Should have a copy, <clears throat> please. Preferably that translation because it's the best one that I've seen, uh, and uh, and everybody should read it, especially during rent, at Lent. At least read one a day. You know, it should just be part of you. Read the scriptures. You know, you're saying your prayers. Thank you so much, Catherine. That's the one. And and read a saying of the Desert Fathers because it's just such a wake up call. And there's stuff in there that is so hard. Like there's one thing in there. I won't tell you what it is, uh, but there was one thing I was reading one day. And I don't ever remember reading it before, but it hurt me for half the day. Like, it hurt me. I was like, I can't believe the things that, that we fall into as Christians, the things that we do to each other. And, like, it was just hard. But that's reality. And then these guys, you know, often the guys who do these terrible things completely turn around and repent. Like St. Moses the Ethiopian, St. Moses the Black. They turn around, they repent, they become miracle workers, you know. And it's a beautiful testament to the mercy and forgiveness and the grace of God. So... That's something that we all need and, and want. You know, we should really want more than anything. Catherine. I was just going to say, Jesus has his arm around the martyr Saint Mena. Oh, is that who he means? Who was seen riding the horse in the battle at, yes. at El Ala. Right. Canyon. Riding the camel. Where that was where his, he came from. Where his relics were. Yes, that was the turning point of the war. That is such a great story. Yeah, I guess the Nazis saw him coming with yeah. hordes. Yeah. But the British didn't see him. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't know that story, that's such a great story. It uh, somehow it hasn't made it into the official history books, but it's made it into our books. Uh, how Winston Churchill calls that battle the turning point of the war. He says, up until that point, we were losing everything. He says, after that point, we began winning. They don't mention in the history books the man on the camel. They don't mention it. But the, the, the Nazis sure mentioned it. The Nazis are like, there was this guy on a camel in the middle of the night. And he woke them, and woke them all up, freaked them all out. He didn't kill anybody. He just woke them all up, and they thought that the British were attacking, so they didn't get any sleep. And so in the morning when the British attacked, the Nazis had no sleep. And so they, they, they lost the battle, and it turned around the whole war. It's an incredible story. St. Man is the Wonder Worker, and he's the one who I talked about on Sunday who held the walls up so the little girl in Turkey didn't get crushed, you know, and then fed her for five days. I mean, just like... So that's St. Manus. So thank you for telling me that's St. Manus on the cover of the book. Are you supposed to say they're mammals? It's a really good question. I haven't read that far into the story, I guess. I don't know. I think the word was bread, but it's entirely possible it was a different kind of bread. God knows. But if the, the story's pretty cool with, without knowing if it's manna or not. I don't know. It could have been sourdough, but uh, it was an amazing story. So anyway, you have Roy. El, El Amin, I think it's it was. It's in Egypt. The, yeah. Oh, okay. It's the furthest, uh, uh, what's his name, Rommel got into uh, into Africa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Right. right. 
It's where the ruins of his church was, where his relics were buried. They picked the wrong battlefield that day. That was an awesome story. And there's an icon on Mount Athos of this event with the British tanks and St. Minas on a camel leading them into battle. Really cool. Anyway, I'm done with that. So, uh, anybody have any other confession questions? I could talk about the saints all night, but I think confessions is... You can have a thought or feeling and you must confess it or only if you ask for it. Great question. Thank you very much. So, really important distinction. If you have thoughts that come to you and you don't entertain them, it's not your sin. So, I, I will give you a personal example. When I'm at the altar, I'm very focused on what we're doing. There are some times when I'm completely focused on prayer, and it's like, and I can feel somebody shoving something into the back of my head, like a thought. And I, like all of a sudden, I'm like, that is not my thought. That's not mine. I don't want that thought. I don't even really know what that is. That's one of the other reasons. I'm like, I don't even, I've never thought about that before. I know, it's the devil. He's just like, get your head out of the liturgy, quick, you know. So if the devil kind of, give, he, he, he likes to do that. He just throws stuff at us. And we're like, well, that's cool. I've never even thought about that before. That's entertain. We start entertaining it. We don't want to do that. The way Bishop Mark used to describe it, I love it. He says, when you hear the devil walking down the hall towards your door, don't open the door. And when you hear him knocking on the door, don't ask him who it is. <clears throat> and when he tells you who he is, don't crack the door to get a look at him. And then, when he gets his little toenail inside the cracked door, don't invite him in for a nightcap. You know, it's this process. You know, it's a, you don't want to flirt with the thing until you find yourself in a full-on relationship with it. So, when thoughts come to you, they are not your thoughts until you engage with them. There are also thoughts that come from within our hearts. We've done this or that in our past, or looked at this that we should never listen to this, and we've got that stuff kind of, it's like, it's saved back there. I wish you could just push a delete button, it was gone, but you can't even do that on email anymore. You know, someone saves it somewhere in a warehouse in the desert, right? Uh, that's so your brain, you know, the fathers say, uh, for example, they say, men, every man will struggle with pride and lust until his last breath. That's what the desert fathers say. Like, they're raising the dead and, like, healing people who are paralyzed and all sorts of stuff, and this is what they're saying about each other. They're like, this is what we should expect. So, when the thoughts come, though, um, we, if, if there are internal thoughts, then it's something where it's, it could be familiar. It's like, oh yeah, I remember that. And then you start thinking about it and entertaining it, you know. And then there are the darts that come from without. And those are the ones when they hit you, you're like, that's not what I thought. And you, you, either way, you have to choose. Am I going to engage with this or not? I will tell you the practical way to fight it. This is what the fathers say, and it works. That is, train yourself. It will take time being an athlete, right? Train yourself so that when you start to hear, you know how it is, have you ever noticed that like on a, on a day when it's, it's a real still day, when the wind is still like down the block, you can start to sense that it's coming. Like there's something almost within your ear, you don't even really know it's coming yet. There's something almost in your ear that can hear that it's in the trees about half a block away before it ever gets to you. Sin, temptation is the same way. You train yourself so that you start to be able to sense when it's approaching, when it's coming down the hall, walking towards your door. And immediately, don't think about it, immediately begin the Jesus prayer. And don't stop the Jesus prayer until you see that it's just gone. It's, it's passed by. Uh, that's it. I mean, the Jesus. there's no more powerful tool, weapon, than the Jesus prayer. It's the name of Christ. You're inviting Christ to come and fight for you. Right? We don't have to put up our dukes and say, okay, demon of lust, here we go. He's just laughing at you. You know, he's like, that's not, that doesn't have to hurt me, your fists. What hurts him is the cross in the name of Christ. So we train ourselves. As soon as we start to hear the wind in the trees down the, down the, the, the block, or we start to hear the footsteps of the evil one approaching down the hallway, we don't even think about what is coming. We train ourselves to immediately engage with the Jesus prayer. And just don't stop until it's gone. And this will become second nature. This is part of, I think, preparing for prayer without ceasing. You know, um, I don't pray without ceasing, so I can't tell you for sure. But I suspect that if we get in that kind of a pattern where we are, it, our, our first instinct is to begin the prayer 
as soon as temptation begins to approach, then that I can see how that would easily begin to turn into a life of prayer, and then uh, eventually kind of a, a pattern of prayer without ceasing. So whoever asked the question, thank you. Yes, Uriel. So towards the end of the prayer, I think there's a part where you say, like, if they've forgotten anything, yeah. please forgive them for it, too. Yeah. So let's say you go to confession, excuse me, and you've forgotten something, and then, like, a week or two later, you're like, oh, no, I forgot to confess this. Mm-hmm. Do you take that confession the next time we go, or just consider that, like, no, that's all I'll forgive them for Great question. So I'm going to give you a yes and no answer. <laughs> if I say... Yes, then you're in danger of becoming Martin Luther, you know, who suffered from uh, scrupulosity. And so for him, he he would remember something or he would have a bad thought as he was walking away from confession and run back to the priest, you know, to confess again. And and, and that's that's just, that's that's not a healthy spiritual life. We are constantly, you know, in, in terror for your own salvation because you had a bad thought or you had a this. That's not what Jesus, I don't see Jesus preaching not what I see. Um, I see him pre- re- preaching repentance. He and John the Baptist and the apostles repent. It's repentance. We have to live a life of learning to turn from sin, repent, change, metanoia, you know, to, to, to learning a life of, of turning away from that which is tempting us, which is a process. We make a, a conscious decision and then actually uh, enforcing that decision and, and living it out is a process. Um, so if we forget something, if it's a major thing, like you go in and you're like, I can't believe I seriously forgot, you know, that I slashed that guy's tires. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> then, yeah, it would be a good thing to bring that back because that's a pretty major thing, you know, um, or something like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's important because it's going to bug you. Even if Jesus forgave it in the corner, you know, which you forgot, I assured you it was forgiven, but it's going to bother you. So if you have something like that, Bring it, because also there's going to be restitution anyway. Uh, you see that throughout the early church, that they're all, and throughout the scriptures. Restitution, that like when you do something, that depending on what it is, you might have to do something to fix the problem. Yeah, you could be forgiven, but there's also a process of giving back. For example, if somebody confesses to me that they stole something, I might not have them go back and face the shopkeeper, you know, and chance being arrested because they did. But, but... I, I might say I want you to send uh, I want you to send a cashier's check for the price of what you took plus fifty bucks uh, and send it anonymously with a note of repentance and say I'm sorry I shouldn't have taken this I did please forgive me accept this whatever like I've done that before why well there's a number of different reasons number one the guy who got his stuff ripped off deserves it uh, number two there's something in you that that there's a sense of justice where you say I want to make this right I really don't want to go you know uh, to jail. Uh, but how can we how can we meet in the middle? So if you slash somebody's tires, for example, uh, Uriel, you're the slasher. If you slash someone's tires, then I'm going to say to you, you have to pay for the tires. We have to figure out a way to make this right, uh, and because that's that's an important thing to do. So anyway, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Usually for, for lifetime confessions, when people bring a list, we burn them over in the candle box in the corner. Yeah, I can do it after that. I've done it for after that. But most of the time, I would say probably 80% of the people don't bring lists after the first time. Um, so that's that's why it's usually for the first time we do it. Uh, but I can do it after that too if you ask. Or if I notice you have a list. Justin. It's 
depends on the sin. Depends on what somebody is struggling with. Um, so, you know, um, <clears throat> well, I won't give examples. But there are certain things where, where people have um, things that they've fallen into that they confess that they, they need they need a penance. They need some means of uh, walking in the right direction. There, there needs to be something that's uh, concrete, that's palpable for them. And so sometimes the penance is through drugs. They ask for, for help. Yes, sir. What about um, talking to other lay Christians? Um, <clears throat> obviously, that's not the, the sacrament of confession. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm if I'm having like a, a frank and candid <coughs> conversation about something that I might be struggling with with just another fellow believer, is that um, is that something to be treated with caution to not do too much mm -hmm. and to save it for confession? Yes, it's the fathers say. For example, when you embark on a spiritual journey, that you you talk to God and your spiritual father about it. That you don't spread it about. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One is because uh, pride, your pride and the other person's pride potentially. Another is because of hurt, possibly hurting the other. If they give you advice, they might give you bad advice, even if they're good people. Right? If you come to a priest, if I've heard, I, I don't, I mean, I've heard, I don't know how many thousands of confessions. I have no idea. I've never tried to count. Right? But um, there is a there is a level of of experience there where you see patterns. And I might give somebody advice they're not expecting because I've seen a lot of, uh, a, a huge pattern in various, various uh, uh, sins and things. And so um, a person who's just your buddy sometimes won't, usually won't have that. You have people who have wonderful wisdom. They just, that's the God-given wisdom, yes. But there's something, when you have a spiritual father, who that's what he does, you know. <clears throat> it's like going to your neighbor and asking, saying, I got a gash in my toe. Do you think it needs stitches? Mm. Right? And then I look at it and they be like, oh, yes, let's get you in the car and take you to the ER right now. And you get to the ER and then they wash off the blood and you realize actually it's only like a quarter of an inch. You know, or the flip side is, no, I think it's fine. And then it gets infected. And then you are in danger of losing a toe, you know. So, yes, confide in buddies. I'm all about that. <laughs> On the one hand, I mean, you know, with where it's appropriate. But at the same time, you know, with spiritual matters, you have to be really careful about what you're revealing. So fathers say, for example, you never talk about your fasting rule or your prayer rule to others. Uh, that you're not, you know, that it's, it's something that's between you and God and your spiritual father. You go into the, the, the quiet closet of your heart. Thomas. What do you do if somebody asks about any of those things? Like, give me an example. Well, like, especially, you know, my experience. I think the best thing I've heard is, yeah, I'm the chief of sinners. I've broken all of the, all of the commandments. <laughs> That's the truth. Jesus said, if you've done it in your heart, you've done it, you know. Uh, so that's, that's the best answer I've heard, and that usually stops the conversation pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what about confession is meant to uh, ecclesiastical officers and take them on Like if you've been Episcopal in your past? You yeah, yeah, that. like that. Like you say, say somebody was Episcopal and they, they went to confession. Yeah. Now they go to a local doctor. Yeah. You bring it all. I bring it all in. It's like going to a new doctor. You bring your medical history. Okay. Because part of, uh, part of what helps you is me knowing what you've been through and where you've been. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it, it just sets us up so we can start making progress quickly instead of me having to get to know you over two years and then say, you know, I see a pattern here. Okay. You know what I mean? So. By the way, Episcopalians don't do private confession. Right. They just do a general confession. Part of the service. Right. Oh, they yes. just continue to have yes. general confession. Great. Talk about this. Okay. Yeah, All right. Anything else? Is that a handout? Yeah. Okay.
just a quick question added on to something someone else asked. <clears throat> there are cases when we may run into someone who's in dire need yes. of confession, say a total stranger. Maybe they're on their deathbed uh, after an accident or something. Mm -hmm. And there's no time to bring a priest, but they want to confess. Can we listen to them and pray with them? Yes. Yeah, it, it won't be the sacrament of confession, but if somebody's dying and says, i, I got to get this off my chest, and for the love of God, yeah, hear what they have to say, pray the Lord's Prayer with them, and, you know, yeah, because if you, you were placed there at their last moment in life, then you're there, you're it, you're the one. I stop at accidents sometimes, you know, and I'm like, are people hurt? Does anybody need a priest? They're not orthodox, but I'm like, if someone's dying in a car... Uh, who else is there hearing their confession? Nobody else is. So it's not the sacrament of confession, but like at that point you're like, this is life. This life is pretty close to ending. We're just going to meet somebody where they are right now because God's in the midst of it. He's everywhere present filling all things. Christian. So if you stop at an accident, yep. someone's not orthodox, yep. they don't really know what they're doing, and they just want to get something out of the chest. Really great question. You're now getting into the mystery. <laughs> so, if somebody's intention was to confess their sins before God before they died, and all they had access to was poor little me or you, God knows the heart. God knows what they're trying to do. Um, that that is that is uh, we have what is normative. You know what what we call the authentic tradition, and then you've got God can work outside the box, and He often. So we've got both of those going on, uh, and, and and we just we trust in the mercy and grace of God in, in emergency and extreme cases like that. Good question. I know everybody needs to go to sleep. Let, you get the last question. Okay. Uh, what books do you recommend reading for confession? Oh, uh, so there is one called the is it the Forgotten Medicine? Is that what it's called? The Forgotten Medicine. Is that Father Seraphim Rose? Or is that Father St. John Maximilian? Who is that? It's been a while since I've read it, but it's a, it was a great book. Anybody know? Somebody's watching online right now. They're like, hey, I got it for you. I can't see you. Um, so, yeah, The Forgotten Medicine, which I think we have in our, if we don't have it in our books in our library, then I probably have it on my own shelf. But it's a good one. Anybody else? Other books on confession? I mean, I don't know. Nicodemus to have you right. Doesn't Augustine have a whole, full, a whole book on confession? Does what? Augustine. That's his confession. <coughs> yes. That's a colorful book. The Confessions of St. Augustine. Yeah. Christian, you had to read that for Nina, you too, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they blushed. All right. Good. Well, with that, let's thank God. We'll stand and thank God. And then everybody departs in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. O Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, grant us always to be totally transparent with you, to have an open heart, and to be willing to confess all that it is that is hidden in our heart to our priest, and to be willing to lay it all out, to be forgiven and to be healed, and uh, always to be trusting in you with every breath. For you are holy together with your Father and your Holy Spirit now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, everyone.